Well, welcome, Paul Holland, General Partner Emeritus of one of the great venture capital firms of all time, Foundation Capital, and currently the Venture Investing Chairman of Mach 49. I'm Rich Callgard, Editor-at-Large and Futurist of Forbes, and I'm wearing sunglasses because I saw the eye doctor a few hours ago and my eyes are dilated and I'm not trying to look cool because I couldn't be cool if I tried. You are cool, Paul, and how you met Reed Hastings at Pure Software. You bet. Uh, no, it's great to see you, Rich, and, and really appreciate your time on this. Uh, so uh, I began my career at SRI, uh, Stanford Research Institute. And uh, as I explained to my kids, I was a human Google. Uh, I basically um, information uh, to answer questions for SRI clients, and then I would type it up. And then in a couple of years after that, I got to type it up on a compact luggable, but that's a that's a whole different thing. I got the I got my first MacBook in 1985, so that was uh, that was exciting, and uh, and then put the answer to their questions in the mail and mailed it off to them. So in their minds, um, so that's how I began my career, uh, and then moved over to actually selling that research to Fortune 500 clients. Um, it was during that time period, uh, I was dating a girl, um, and married to Linda Yates today, so that's good. And uh, my best friend from SRI was a guy named Matt Grady, and he brought his best friend from the Peace Corps. Uh, they taught mathematics together in the homelands of uh, apartheid uh, South Africa, and his name was Reed Hastings. So uh, we literally met in a hot tub. We joke about that uh, to this day. And um, later, Reed invented a new way to find errors in software that was revolutionary. And he called me up and said, uh, hey, do you want to join me at this company that eventually became known as Pure Software? Uh, and then, um, you know, we took that company public. Uh, we sold it to IBM for about two and a half billion dollars. And uh, that got me started uh, down the entrepreneurial path. Well, it's amazing to think of your, your respective backgrounds, you and Reed, that he began uh, his adult life as a vacuum cleaner salesman door to door, and uh, you, were a, you were a human Google. And uh, neither one, maybe the vacuum cleaner salesman, by virtue of the fact somebody who's out there selling, might have predicted an entrepreneurial future. Um, yours probably didn't. Um, but how did, that, how did that come together? What were the catalysts in your own lives, and what did pure software what was that ride like and what did you learn about each other and about yourselves yes yeah, so that's a, a terrific question so when i uh when i was coming off of my work with sri uh i did a instant being in the beautiful Haas school um over on the on the berkeley campus and as i my last was back 300 plus years in the south farmers and bureaucrats basically and uh now they were multimillionaires and had a hundred ice cream stores around the whole country and so forth. And it occurred to me that I could be one of those chuckleheads someday if I, if I got the right opportunity. And it was as I was finishing the course uh, that Matt reconnected me with, uh, with Reed and Reed called up and said, Hey, do you want to, do you want to help me uh, get started with this company? So that was really my, you know, I was, it was totally kismet. Um, I got bitten by the bug. I was looking for, hey, do you want to, someday and decided to open an ice cream store and then now they were multimillionaires and had 100 ice cream stores around the whole country and so forth and it occurred to me that i could be one of those chuckleheads someday if i if i got the right opportunity and it was as i was finishing the course uh, that matt reconnected me with uh, with reed and reed called up and said hey do you want to do you want to help me uh, get started with this company so that was really my you know i was it was totally kismet um i got bitten by the bug I was looking for a really good opportunity. It was in the early 1990s uh, recession, so there weren't a lot of great ones out there. And, um, you know, I started working with Reed. He was programming up in his house in La Honda, uh, famous uh, later when Pure went public because no heat in the house and uh, they, they, had a, they had a wood stove and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really fortunate for me, you know, not just working with him, but working with a whole kind of, you know, band of brothers and sisters to really bring that company to reality, bring it to the marketplace. I ran sales in North America when we were small and, and then Reed asked uh, Linda and me to move over to Amsterdam where I ran, started and ran the European operation. Um, so it was, it was the storybook, you know, kind of first startup, taking it public, working with amazing venture capitalist, Andy Radcliffe, uh, who later co-founded Benchmark and, and some others. Uh, but uh, we, you know, we went through a lot of 
um, you know, growth, growth pains along the way, made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot about managing people and, um, you know, that kind of stuff uh, in our, in our first startup. Well, it's so interesting as you describe that story, there must be some magic at, at Berkeley because I think of um, but Gordon Moore, um, you know, one of the founders of, of Intel and before that, Fairchild Semiconductor, always described himself as an accidental entrepreneur. That was, he was the technical genius who fell in with the right, who fell in with Bob Noyce and, and together they created something mighty. And, and the third person in that was Andy Grove. And Andy Grove was a graduate school also hey, in, one, two, in Berkeley. And Andy three, Gro Grove describes the serendipity. Two, I, I never two, think two, of Andy three, Grove as a serendipitous figure because he's such a strong-willed figure, but he describes the serendipity of his time uh, in the 1950s and meeting Gordon Moore in grad school. And up until the moment that he met Gordon Moore and became interested in what Gordon Moore was doing, Andy Grove assumed he would go into what was the hot industry of the time, nuclear power, civilian nuclear right. power. And that was the serendipitous moment that he went into a growth, growth industry. Well, what, uh, how did, uh, did, I mean, Reed Hastings is a brilliant figure and a charismatic figure and a person with, with real conviction. And to get you and Linda to move to Amsterdam, I mean, you're all in at that point. What, what did he, what did he say to you that was so exciting? <laughs> it's so funny you asked me that. And, and, and as you know, we didn't rehearse this, but it's a, it's a funny story in and of itself. So um, Reed had had determined that we needed to replace the sort of the contractor we had, who was um, frankly robbing us blind in Europe. He, we later learned he was uh, sending us one dollar, but he was charging five dollars for the product and uh, keeping the difference. So that was a that was a little bit of a, a struggle. So when I moved over there, I got him sorted out, and then uh, and then we started what became a very successful business. But you know, it's a funny story. So Reed, he read, he sat Linda and me down and. You know, I kind of recalled this stuff because we were all really learning to, to be managers and executives. And so, you know, he was doing this for the very first time, asking somebody to move, you know, uh, and, and so forth and, and make a big move at that. And um, and so I recall he he said, OK, he's, he's a mathematician, so he's up on the board and he's going to write out, you know, kind of like the plan. Like, OK, this is why it makes sense for you guys to do this. And And he said, Paul, you know, you're making... 150k a year as a as the sales manager, which you know, at the time was 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 okay. Um, it wasn't unbelievable, but it was it was okay. Uh, but I had one percent of the company, so he said, "Look, I think it's going to be worth it for you to make this move and and to go over there." And and you know he was he was generally right. Uh, and then at that point, he turned to Linda and he said, "Okay, Linda, you know what are you making these days?" And and she said, "Well, this year I'll make about five hundred thousand dollars." And she was twenty nine years old. And so, but she was running a management consulting firm on the West Coast and had 110 people working for her. And so he got up back on the whiteboard and he turned around and he said, look, I can't make those numbers foot. I said, this is something you guys are just going to have to decide to do. And, you know, it's, it's one of the many things I admired about working with him and for him is that, you know, it would have been very easy for him to try to shine us on and, and you know, sort of make something up. But you know, the math didn't seem like it would make sense. Now, Pure later ended up being worth more than a billion dollars. So uh, the math worked out, you know, quite well for for all of us from that perspective. And then once we got over there, that's when Linda started her company, Strategus. So it, it was kind of all's well that ends well. But but so many of the things we did then in our late twenties and early thirties, we were doing for the very first time. And because Reed had written such a compelling piece of software, uh, the stakes got higher and higher every month because the company was so successful. Well, there's a, the next phase of your career, I want to move through very quickly because I want to spend primarily your time at Foundation and, you know, working with Reed again on Netflix and some of the other great companies that you produced as an 18 year, 18 year partner and now your partner at Emeritus at Foundation. And then talk about the fascinating work that you and your wife, Linda, are doing with Mach 49, bringing Silicon Valley venture capital in-house into major corporations around the world. But Kana Software, uh, you, you'd caught the attention of uh, Benchmark uh, uh, during Pure Software, and they um, pulled you into um, pulled you into Kana. Uh, so, how did that go? What did you learn at Kana, and then how did what was then the the pathway to Foundation Capital? 
Yeah, so an, another great question and hopefully an interesting story. So when Reed had asked me and Linda to, to move to Amsterdam, uh, I sat down with Andy Radcliffe, who was our, our one of our main board members, along with Mike Leventhal. Uh, Mike was at Mayfield at the time. And uh, and I said to Andy, I said, look, you know, this is very exciting, but what happens if I'm over there and Reed, just, Reed gets hit by a bus? Meaning, you know, the bus, there's no company. So, um, but but in any case, uh, regardless of that, I'll get you back. Like, uh, you know, we won't strand you out there. I'll find a way. So, bef- uh, you know, I was a long way before I became a venture capitalist, but I learned a lot from Andy uh, being a board member and how he treated me and what it took for him to kind of personally guarantee that he would help out in what would be kind of a sticky situation. Of course, everything worked out great. You know, I, I came home to roses and and uh, and garlands and, and and wreaths and all that stuff. So, so none of that stuff came to the fore. But yeah, when I um, uh, after after Pure Software, Linda and I were fortunate. We took an eight month sabbatical. We traveled around. I went back to Andy, and by then he had co founded Benchmark Capital. He had left Merrill Pickard. Uh, Merrill Pickard, as you know. Um, created both benchmark capital and foundation capital where I ended up. But I went back to Andy and I said, you know, what do you think I ought to do next? And he said, I'm going to introduce you to, to Mark Ainey and Michael Horvath at this company, Kana Communications. So he got me connected to his partner, David Byrne, who became my board member. Uh, they recruited me. Uh, I became the number two exec. I ran the global go-to-market, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, sort of sales and uh, business uh, uh, acquisition all around the world. And Kana was phenomenological. Um, you know, we went from $14 million valuation when Benchmark invested, in, which is right around the time I joined. And then we hit $9 billion uh, for about 15 microseconds uh, during February of 2000 with a 80-knot tailwind from the uh, Internet 1.0. But, uh, you know, that was an amazing experience. I, you know, Pure was will always be, I think, my favorite job because it was my, you know, my first startup and I just felt so close to the people at Kana, I, I I learned a lot. I grew up a lot as an executive, and 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 sort of, you know, uh, understanding the responsibility that comes with generating that much market cap and that much value. Uh, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, to my eye, revealed to you that your superpower in startups is really kind of rapid scale operations. Uh, would that be sort of a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah. My whole my tagline is. Taking software companies from zero to 100 million. That's 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 my 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 jam. And you know, I always looked at startup companies. There are very, 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 very few people who go the distance. Um, you know, they have names like Larry Ellison and Michael Dell and you know a handful of others. And for most companies, that it's almost like a relay race that the the people who can get it off the ground, some of them, and usually the founder, better be the founder, you know, uh, have the vision to lead it to 100 million and then a billion. But some people are really good at getting it from 10 million to 100 million or 100 million to um, a billion. And um, those are all prized, especially by venture capital firms, especially for a multi layer, you know, uh, in it many rounds, big firm like Foundation Capital. How did you take what you learned at Pure and Kana and apply it to your uh, investment decisions and uh, ways of assessing startup teams at Foundation Capital? Well, I, uh, my answer will probably surprise you a little bit. I, I applied it really poorly uh, initially when, when I came in. Um, when I was recruited in, Catherine Gould, Mike Shu, uh, Paul Kuntz, and the other folks, Bill Elmore, our, our co-founder, um, you know, their message to me was, look, you're you're 15 years into your operating career. You've just come off of two successful startups. You've got amazing networks. Let's go mine those networks and let's go, you know, let's go back some of the entrepreneurs that you've gotten to know over that time period. So uh, in the course of my uh, I've gone back, unfortunately, and I've 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 counted the, uh, you know, the, the missed opportunities. But in the course of my first five years, I brought companies in front of the partnership that ended up being worth about 50 billion dollars. But I, I only did one or two of the smaller ones of those uh, during that time period and really made a lot of mistakes in my first, uh, particularly in my first fund at Foundation. And one of the things that I learned as an investor is that, you know, it would have been better for me had I had a more of a normal distribution of failure and success in startups, because what I found myself doing is I kept looking for Reed Hastings and Mark Ganey in every 
founder and and I now know you know 30 years later that um you know those were two of the best guys in their time uh to 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 do what they that, that they needed to do so um you know that was the learning for me and it took a while to do that it took a while for me to kind of trust my instincts a little bit more and and frankly at that point to get my partners to go along with some of those things so really the second half of my uh 20 years at foundation were were remarkably successful uh, specifically compared to the first. I did Chegg as an early stage investment. It went to 14 billion. I did Mobile Iron as an early stage. It went to over a billion. Um, I did a handful of uh, security companies for Spawn Software with my friend Mike Armistead, who I recruited to Pure Software uh, and others. And those added up to you know a couple billion dollars of outcomes uh, over time. So um, you know, I always had heard this expression. I think it was credited to David Byrne at uh, at, Be at Benchmark. That you got to crash, uh, you know, two or three F-16s before you really learn how to be a venture capitalist. And I definitely crashed my my three uh, along the way uh, before I I kind of got my feet under me. And then at that point, I was you know I was doing a better job of practicing what we preached, which is looking for market technology or solution, and then people. And the people part of it are last, not because people are last, but it's because, you know, if you need to, and about half the time we would change people uh, if we thought the opportunity was great enough that it made sense to move on. Um, but as you noted, I, I was really fortunate, um, you know, by working with Reed and working with Mark, they made it new skills as an investor, as a venture capitalist, and, and ultimately it paid off. Well, and speaking of Reed, he did it once more, uh, in order of magnitude, Larger in terms of market cap and global penetration with, with a few Netflix. Yeah. Describe how a foundation's relationship with Netflix and maybe maybe uh, describe one or two of the pivot points uh, along the way because I think that you know you look back and uh, at any big successful company like Netflix and maybe there's a temptation. Not those of you who live it. Certainly not a Silicon Valley documentarian like you are. You know there are no immaculate conceptions, there are no smooth paths, and there are inflection points, and at those inflection points, things could go right or they could go wrong. And uh, describe some of those inflection points and how you, um, you know, the uh, read as, as this wonderful quote I came across in, in this video, a uh, little uh, animated video uh, that's on the Foundation Capital website, and he's, he's sort of using the analogy of chess, and that is, it's the CEO's job to prune the tree of possibilities. And I think that, you know, pruning the tree of possibilities, you still have, you're still at the inflection point, but maybe you have a better vision of what you should do and a better sense of the risk if you make this decision versus that. But anyway, talk about those inflection points that existed with uh, Foundation Capital and Netflix. Yeah, so uh, IBM. Uh, he and our VP of marketing and another good friend, Mark Randolph, were commuting together back and forth uh, to uh, Sunnyvale um, from their homes in, uh, in the Santa Cruz area. And as they did that, they were basically doing the kind of the classic gap analysis. They knew they weren't going to stay long term in the acquired company um, or the acquiring company. So they began to think about these different things. And that's when the, you know, now nearly, you know, sort of mythological proportions of the Reed going to pay for his kids uh, uh, blockbuster um, rentals and finding out the late fee and then figuring out that the business model was to charge a late fee and, and et cetera, et cetera. But they, they looked at and thought through a lot of different ideas of different things that they could do. Uh, I think if I, if I recall, you know, one of the things at that time is they were looking for something fresh. So they were both kind of hardcore technologists, hardcore software guys. And I think the idea of disrupting the media industry was, was very appealing. Um, Foundation got involved in uh, from the very, very early stages. Mike Shu, my partner, uh, led our investment there in December of 1998. Uh, when I was at Pure Software in the early 90s, Mike was sort of a, a consultant who came in and, and helped us learn how to do sales better. And that's how Mike and I became friends. He was one of the people who recruited me to Foundation. And, uh, you know, so Mike had had this very strong relationship with Reed. The Series A for Netflix was led uh, by Tim Haley. Uh, Tim was, uh, you know, the recruiter at Pure Software back in the day and then went to Red Point Partners. And then Mike Shu was sort of the contract VP of sales for a while. And then he he supported Reed uh, with the Series B. Um, but, you know, I would say foundations probably funded plus or minus 500 companies. 
And I would say our story is going to be similar to other top tier investors. Every one of those companies runs into trouble and some of them run into mortal danger. Um, and Netflix was no stranger to that, you know, probably came close to running out of money six different times, um, had all sorts of different, you know, things that were folks that came in, uh, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the I'm blanking on his name, Jay Hogue at TCB came in and did a very meaningful uh, financing uh, that really helped the company survive and thrive and move forward. And he became one of the best investors ever as a result of doing that. Um, I did recall at one point, Reed had to get on a plane and fly to Europe and met with Bernard Arnault from LVMH Hennessy Moe and, uh, and Bernard wrote a check as an investor into the company and, uh, and that, you know, helped keep it going uh, during that time period. So yeah. at the time we're recording this on December 10th, 22, uh, surpassed, um, Elon Musk is the world's wealthiest man, according to Forbes. So there you have oh. it. I'm glad yeah, you're here. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah, helped him, helped him push it to the top. Yeah. He's a very smart guy. And it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's not a very well-known, investment it may be the best corporate venture capital investment in history but uh it doesn't it doesn't get chronicled that, that way but at any rate you know um netflix needed money uh because they were trying to do something really big and so they were you know kind of constantly in need of raising the next round raising the next round i think to your comment earlier rich you know what people now they look at it and in hindsight think well this was going to be this huge company they they really turned the entire global media market upside down and they're worth every penny of their valuation, even though it's a little bit lower now than it was a year or two ago. Um, but, you know, it wasn't casually obvious. I mean, this was one of dozens of investments that Foundation had made during that time period. Um, you know, they, they, they felt good about it, but, um, you know, it was... I'll just give you kind of a, a little data point. Um, you know, we helped we helped take the company public in 2003, and especially coming off of the boom years we've had in the last couple of years, where there was God knows 500 IPOs a year, there were six technology IPOs in the year 2003. All right, we were still very much coming off the uh, the mat from uh, from the um, from the, the the internet bubble bursting. And uh, I always tell people, I ask when I'm giving these lectures at schools, I say. You know, what do you think the valuation was of Netflix when it went public? And people think, well, it was three billion or five billion or seven billion. And I said, well, it was three hundred and fifty million dollars. And I said, and the minute it came out, you know, the big competitors were trying to snuff it out in the crib. Basically, uh, Blockbuster announced a huge initiative. They ultimately, we had heard that they paid IBM two hundred million dollars to help try to recreate Netflix after ignoring Netflix and deciding it wasn't worth buying them along the way. Amazon went after them. Walmart went after them, you know, kind of after them. Stock actually dropped down to $180 million market cap. So I tell people, you know, you could have owned 10% of Netflix for $18 million. Um, and Barry McCarthy, who, who became a, a good friend and he was CFO at the time, he actually came in and took over my board seat at Chegg, uh, one of my most successful investments. And when we were deliberating uh, what when to take Chegg public, and, and the importance of the IPO, Barry was, was very, uh, you know, poignant and very articulate. He said, doing the IPO at Netflix at the time that we did it saved the company because that money, the 75 million or so that was made during the IPO, that allowed us to get through that, you know, really torturous kind of early uh, learning to walk as a public company trying to phase. And then, then once they really hit their stride, then people began to understand the power behind the model. I remember that Reed used to have to do the analyst uh, meetings and, and every time the analysts are like, well, you know, you need to give us profit. You know, we need to see why are you spending so much money on marketing? If I recall, they were the top internet advertiser two or three years in a row. And Reed's commentary back to them was really clear. He said, you don't understand the size of the market that we're going after. And they didn't, they just couldn't get their heads around it. They thought it was a traditional media company, judging it by traditional media metrics. They had no idea that Netflix was going to light up a billion people around the world uh, and enable the entire, you know, kind of e economy around streaming and content that we know today. So, you know, that was the great thing about working with Reed going all the way back in, when we were in our 20s is that, you know, he's he's just a very high conviction person, uh, super ethical, uh, super blunt. I mean, he's like, he's, 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 he's a very nice guy and, and comes off as a very nice guy all the 
all the time. But um, you know, if you if you end up kind of getting sideways, particularly on something he doesn't think is is right, uh, he'll he'll let you know. And um, but yeah, it was it for me. It was just a joy to be able to have that experience and 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 to do it, and and then to be able to watch his success and Mark's success and everybody else's success. Of, you know, half half a dozen of the key people at Pure Software, Neil Hunt, Patty McCord, Stan Lanning, they all went over and, and joined Reed early. And, um, you know, they deserve every every level of success uh, that they got. Well, let's jump to the present and this fascinating company that you and your wife, Linda Yates, have founded. She's the CEO. You're the venture investing chairman, Mott 49. And this idea that it's time for a really re big reboot for venture capital inside of G1000 companies, which is not a new idea, but it, but it hasn't been particularly success, successful other than for Intel Capital and maybe a handful of others. And one could say, well, that's just the nature of large companies, they'll never get it right. Or you could look at it as you and Linda do and say, this is the, the mother of all huge untapped opportunities here um, describe Mach 49 and what led you to create it and where you are now. Yeah, so th so thank you for that. It, just for clarification, I am not anywhere near the co-founder of Mach 49. So it was founded by Lindy Yates and uh, Russ Lampert and Brad Sherrick, uh, uh, sort of lifelong friends uh, of, of ours. And, um, you know, Linda has had this stellar career in the world of strategy and working with large companies. She's really got one foot in the Silicon Valley, she's a, a fifth generation Northern California entrepreneur, which is pretty, pretty rare. Uh, her grandfather was effectively the co-founder of what is now Bechtel. He was the project manager at the Hoover Dam. Her father was born at the Hoover Dam. So, you know, very, very uh, strong kind of family background around entrepreneurship and business and so forth. But Linda, you know, she began her career in investment banking, got a graduate degree at Stanford, went into strategy consulting. And it was there that she met Gary Hamill and C.K. Perhalad and started the company Strategos that you know of, rocket ship, sort of corporate transformation company very early in that world, really the first kind of boutique consultancy focused on growth. Um, so they did really well with that. Uh, and then um, Linda got nominated to the board of the, of the Crown, uh, uh, as a Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute, uh, got nominated by Reed Hastings. Uh, went on the board of Sybase, uh, was there from three bucks to 65 bucks. So she got a much bigger carry check in the 2000s than, than I did uh, working in venture capital. And then about 10 years ago, she quite literally said to me, look, I think I need to start the Y Combinator for the Global 1000. I think they're, you know, I had, I had done the movie Something Ventured, uh, which, as you know, chronicles the sort of founding venture investments in the Silicon Valley, Apple, Intel, um, yeah, that quote that you mentioned from Gordon Moore is actually in my film. So it's, uh, he calls himself the accidental entrepreneur. And, and then I wrote a follow on piece with Huffington Post called Dreamers and Disruptors. And that really described how the venture industry had gone from funding sort of in with hospitality who wants to fix errors in software, pure software to Reed Hastings that wants to blow up the global media industry or, you know, Travis with transportation, Brian with hospitality, Elon with whatever the hell he wants to do, right? So that was the the change that occurred. And she recognized that change and she recognized that her constituency, her clients at large companies were going to need help. So she put together this all-star team, um, really the first of its kind in the world that combines sort of product people, venture capitalists, and um, anybody's ever heard of. It's grown 800% in the last two years. And uh, the company's now publicly stated value she was working on was really helping companies build new ventures and sort of growth strategies, growth incubators. And that's chronicled in her book, uh, The Unicorn Within. Which is by... right off my shoulder here. You can see it. Yeah. It's an absolutely fantastic book. I'm a huge fan of everything that Gary Hamill has written. This is part of the Linda Yates, Gary Hamill tree, C.K. Prahalahad. It's just a fantastic book. Well, you're very, you're very kind. I, I happen to agree with you. And so, so does the, uh, the people keeping the list. So number one, new strategy release on uh, Amazon, number one, new release in venture capital. So that's gone quite well. Um, so after she got started and I was sort of like the guest VC that would come and wave my arms and say, AI hey, and ML and tell all these big companies, we're going to put them out of business. And then Linda would get up and sort me out and, uh, and, and correct me. And, 
you know, we had sort of a happy accident. A, a friend of ours, a mom from Stanford Sea Air Camp, Bonnie Simi, came to us and said, hey, can you guys help me start JetBlue Technology Ventures? So really just as a side hustle and to help we got started with JetBlue, uh, TDK, Xerox, Goodyear, uh, and now across in my group, which is part of Linda's business, we've got uh, 23 of the Fortune 1000. Uh, we, uh, Hitachi, uh, some of the major energy companies, most of the mining companies, they're all working towards moving away from the internal combustion engine toward the electric economy, building batteries, um, whatever it might happen to be. We've even worked with some of the needs of these large companies. And so with doing that, you know, we've created, you know, sort of award-winning new style corporate venture groups at companies like TDK and Xerox and Goodyear and others. And, um, you know, now it seems like that's a big trend that people are moving towards, but that's, that's what we do. What I like about Linda's book is that it's very lively. It's learned, it's lively, but there's just, it's rich in detail and methodology. And it's the methodology that I think will help large companies um, the, 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 the unspoken bias or spoken bias is that, you know, companies east of Reno will never get it. Uh, they have too many institutional biases. Clayton Christensen wrote about some of the challenges that they have not invented here. Um, you know, uh, uh, the risk reward profile is completely different. Um, before we wrap up here, just sort of talk about some of the biases that people in Silicon Valley might unfairly have about G1000 companies' ability to innovate and really grow high-valued companies or divisions or spin-offs within. And what? To, how do you? How do you methodically move the risk of those institutional barriers? Yeah. So, so first thing to note, I think you know Clayton, God rest his soul. He he was saying all those things before Uber, Airbnb, and serious about this, and so. So I think Linda's timing with the unicorn within and with Mach 49 worked out so well is that these large companies and their boards uh, became, you know, a lot more serious about trying to figure out ways to jumpstart growth and to create new uh, and successful startups. Uh, there are a lot of inertia, a lot of antibodies, a lot of not invented here, uh, a lot of uh, negativity um, that can happen within the corporate environment. But I would say here are the, the 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 two biggest surprises to the positive, and then I, I I'd like to finish up with a question for you, Rich. But is that the only way you get to be a really top performing venture capitalist is to do it this way, right? You know, join a join a firm, analyst associate, kind of work your way up, do the, the different things, and sort of this long apprenticeship or whatever it might happen to be. And and we have proven, you know, sort of empirically that it doesn't have to be just that way. We're taking people who are mid, upper, mid-level managers out of some of the large corporations, and, and not surprisingly, that's turning into significant results. So this is a new model. It's it's really kind of you know you know he had a he he bought into the vision that bought into the vision that.